Welcome back to the Financial Symmetry Show. I am your host today, Allison Berger, and I am joined by the lovely Grace Cavantes, Haley Modlin, and Darian Billingsley. We are teaming up today to bring you a special episode in honor of International Women's Day. International Women's Day on March 8th is a global celebration of the social, economic, cultural, and political achievements of women. The day also marks a call to action for accelerating women's equality. Here at Financial Symmetry, the topic of women's retirement income security is near and dear to our hearts, and we know that the investment and retirement planning experience can be different for women. The theme of this year's International Women's Day is Break the Bias. So today on our show, we want to highlight some unique considerations that women face in planning for retirement and some biases they may come up against and how they can overcome and achieve in spite of those. So Grace, do you want to kick us off? I know that you have a big one that we talk about a lot around here uh, pertaining to investments. Yes. One bias that we see a lot in the financial world is that women are afraid of investing, which if this is the case, would really impact women's retirement long-term because that means that their life savings would not be growing at a rate that you get if you're invested in equities versus just keeping your money parked under your mattress or at the bank. Research has actually shown that this is not the case. It's not true that women are more fearful of investing for men. But what they have found is that women are more likely to take calculated risks. So they're more likely to have an appropriate amount of stock investment versus cash at the bank. So that's one difference and um, disproves this bias. Uh, And in my experience as a financial advisor to both men and women, Um, And in my little corner of the financial world, I have found that when I have new clients, that there's an equal percentage of any gender that that's fearful at the beginning of their investing uh, life. So um, I have found that to be true. And similarly, when markets feel uncertain, I actually find that I hear more often from men than women by a lot. Now, that's not a bad thing necessarily. That's part of my job and why I'm here. I'm here to walk through those scary or uncertain times with clients, but it's just a difference that I've noticed between men and women in investing. And that might not be true of all advisors' clients. It might just be mine. So I'm curious, what have you ladies experienced? Yeah, I think that's a a big one, Grace, and one that, as you said, can work to women's detriment in retirement if their advisor thinks women should be uh, allocated less to stocks, because that means that their rate of return is going to be lower over the long term. They're not going to keep up with inflation as much, and they're going to lose purchasing power over time. And actually what studies have found, I know we highlighted one recently on the show out of MIT um, that found that investors who are male over the age of 45 and consider themselves as having excellent investment experience are the ones that are most likely to freak out and dump their portfolios during a market downturn. Um, so this always makes me wonder, you know, if maybe if they were married, if their, their wife was considered in this decision to dump the investment portfolio. Um, but typically we find that women actually make better investors than men over the long term. They tend to research their investments more, have more intentionality and self-control and, and higher savings rates. Um, I have found, I would say that women aren't necessarily scared. They might be a little bit more cautious about things that they are unfamiliar with. So when you take into consideration the fact that they are, you know, historically been less involved in investing and uh, family finances, so they're, you know, playing catch up and learning a lot from scratch, especially um, older women who might not have, you know, had the opportunities to, you know, invest or manage portfolios earlier in their lives. Um, And once you get the education part in there and you're there to hold their hand and, you know, show them what investing is all about and how they can do it. They tend to be quite excited about, um, you know, investing and not just fearful. And I would just reiterate that the fear of investing is not a gender thing. Um, It can be a feeling that anyone can have. It's like Haley mentioned, they don't have the education and specific to women taking that calculated risk or making a more cautious decision. um, That could be reflective even of the fact that they may feel they have to invest with their income differently than say a man might. Because one thing that maybe we haven't touched on is women get paid less than men. So they may not be ready to risk as much in the market as you know, say their male counterpart in the same position might. Yeah, Haley, you have some more for us on this, on the gender pay gap, right? My bias that I wanted to bring up was compensation biases. Just the general you know, thought that a woman's work is worth less than a man's. I know that's not the first time 
anybody has heard about this or first time we've even discussed it, but on average, women make about 84 cents to the man's dollar. We've seen this in studies, in the news, um, most recently in court cases with the US soccer team's labor dispute. Um, so we know that there are biases around how compensation is structured for women. Some studies have partially contributed that to there also being not just a gap in income, but a gap in asking for income. Women tend to ask for less or negotiate less, and then just sometimes not even at all when it comes to their salary and their benefits. Um, that means that they earn less annually, earn less over their careers, and then have less to contribute towards retirement in the future and have a higher dependency on income like social security. So we do have a couple of tips for how to overcome this hurdle or bias. Um, the first one would be, of course, is knowledge is power. Researching what standard salaries are for your area of the country and then what field you are in. You can use websites like Glassdoor or salary.com. And there's also no shame in discussing these topics with your friends, families, or coworkers. Now, sometimes discussing these with those people, if you find out that you are making much less, it is natural to want to hold a grudge against the people who earn more, but remember that they are sharing this with you to equip you and give you more information to better yourself. So just a reminder there. Um, and once you have your information, you can set a range that would work well for you, that you believe that your work is worth and what you might need um, economically for your household. If you have a range, always shoot for the top of your range and it leaves room for negotiation or maybe even a pleasant surprise. Maybe your management you know, gives you exactly what you asked for the first time. Um, come prepared with that number and a list of skills and accomplishments and contributions that you've added to your organization or your role. Um, with that, lots of practice, of course, will make you a much better sales pitch if you're selling yourself and know that timing is key. So a lot of people would ask for things with a performance review. Um, I have seen areas to suggest that maybe putting a little bug in your manager's ear before that along the lines when budgets are being made so that they can keep that in mind when they're making um, performance reviews. And then also Thursday and Fridays have been shown a better day because most people want to finish off the week on a good note versus earlier in the week when people are just readjusting back into the work week. Have you guys had any um, interesting experience negotiating salaries or with clients? Any tips you want to add on to that? I would just add, don't be afraid to do the research. Even if you haven't yet found the comfortability with speaking to how there may be a pay gap, especially in your industry, being aware is the first step. So you can decide if you're okay with making less or are you actually prompted to ask for more because you know your work that you're doing is just as great as anybody else who may be earning more in the same position. Yeah, those are awesome tips. And I think um, all of these are kind of like dominoes that happen throughout a woman's life and throughout her career that can really change the retirement picture. Um, I think income is probably one of the biggest, but if we're consistently underpaid, under allocated to equities, um, Darian, I know we have a big one coming up, yeah. maybe potentially spending too much. Um, if all of these things, it's either could be dominoes and uh, in the right direction or the other. So if we can kind of harness these powers and the opportunities like Haley suggested to look for areas to increase that income on the front end that really improves the retirement income picture. Um, so we talked a lot about income. Darian, I know you had some, uh, some on the flip side about spending, right? Yeah, so there's this bias out there that we all know. And if you've um, watched the popular um, Carrie Bradshaw in Sex and the City, you know women are portrayed as big spenders or even overspenders in comparison to men. Um, that is a bias that is worth breaking because it's not true in every situation. Um, research has been conducted to show that men are equally as likely to be overspenders as women. Um, and one way that we see that is in what we spend our money on, um, whether it's hobbies, whether it's fashion, whether it's dining out and DoorDash. Every person is going to have their different area of their budget in which they may tend to overspend compared to someone else, or if you're in a couple, overspend compared to your partner. Another consideration is the fact that women typically are the spenders in a couple. So they are going out, they're buying groceries or they're paying bills sometimes. Um, and they're not always spending all that money on themselves either. Um, and then another aspect to pay attention to when addressing women and their spending is that there's often a peak tax, um, which reflects the fact that goods and services for women often cost a little bit more on their dollar than they do for men who are getting the same goods and services. 
Have you guys experienced um, with working with client couples where it's just the woman who is an overspender, or do you often see kind of like research suggests that it could be either partner? I think that both with clients and just in my personal experience with friends and family that it's really a toss up on which you know side of a couple spends more. There's I haven't really seen a rhyme or reason. I will say that in families, um, typically woman would be the higher spender because they are the ones out, you know, make sure the kids have, you know, new sneakers for school or the new soccer uniforms. Um, the whole family is being fed with groceries and, you know, shampoo is on the shelf for everybody. So um, whereas things might be equal, it could appear that, you know, women spend more in those circumstances because they're making sure everybody's taken care of. That is a really good point. And um, Darian, I love that you touched on that spending doesn't have a gender. And we, I, I think we should add that we as financial advisors at Financial Symmetry, we get to see the way our clients spend. I know that's not the case for all financial advisors, but that's something we help our clients track and stay on top of for them. So we do get an interesting insider perspective on that. And so with any couple, there's always going to be one that spends more. Sometimes it's women, sometimes it's men. It just depends what the spending is on. Yeah, I know this is a big one. And a lot of times we think about budgeting as a major part of financial planning. And sometimes we do put the onus on women that they are the overspenders. And as Haley said, we don't really see a breakdown that that's always the case. And typically in a couple, just uh, as the universe would have it, a spender tends to marry a saver. Um, it's important to know that those two things balance each other out. And it's important to have characteristics of both. We want to create balance in our lives and uh, not necessarily blame or shame someone for spending because it's something that is necessary in all of our lives over the long term. Um, and Haley, you said something earlier about women playing catch up that I think really kind of plays into one of these biases that we see is that women are not interested in financial topics or in uh, retirement planning or investments. And I don't necessarily think it, that it's that women don't want to be involved, but maybe that they haven't traditionally been invited or welcome into the conversation. Um, so that's something that we try to change here and make sure that uh, women investors that we're working with know that this is a, a safe place for them to share their concerns and any questions that they have. And um, in some cases, maybe it's appropriate for the wife to come in for a meeting on her own to ask questions separate from her husband. Um, I know we see that sometimes because occasionally women can feel um, like they're all of their questions aren't addressed in a meeting with a couple. What have you guys seen in that from time to time? I've actually seen circumstances where a client couple has come in and maybe the wife felt overwhelmed in the conversation. And it's, you know, maybe her husband was asking all of his questions, but she didn't really have a chance to address hers. So to your point on having separate meetings, um, that gives the opportunity for the interest to come out when the overwhelming feeling goes away, because you can have a candid conversation about, there are concerns as a couple, but maybe some things that, you know, the woman um, of the couple may not have felt comfortable speaking up about previously. I can also go the other way, but when we're looking at a household's entire financial picture, an hour long or hour and a half long meeting, just sometimes we can't cover it all. So I do love the idea of extra meetings when they're needed. Yeah, I think absolutely what we've touched on today is none of these issues are specifically women's issues. It's just that maybe women haven't always been traditionally thought of in this uh, financial investing role. So we want to bring those issues to the forefront and point out that particularly with, when we're working with a couple, there does tend to be one spouse who maybe leads the conversation more than the other. Um, so we want to make sure that maybe the spouse who is a little bit less dominant or not as talkative is getting their needs met and uh, concerns addressed as well. So those are some ideas for how we might be able to bring someone into the conversation who uh, hasn't been as outspoken potentially. Any others that you guys think of? I'm sure there are plenty of others that we have not thought of yet. Um, maybe that's a topic for next year. Yes. So I think to our listeners, if you are listening and you think of other biases that women face as they plan for their retirement and in their investment journey, reach out. Uh, we'd love to hear from you and hear what you're facing out there and how we might be able to help as you plan for your retirement and investment journey. And as far as progress principles go moving forward, we want to think about if any of these four biases have shown up in your life and how you might be able to use some of the resources that we provided today to work towards your goals of a secure retirement. Um, and break the bias in areas where you have control over. Maybe you're a hiring manager, maybe you're looking at your employee's payroll, or maybe you're simply looking at your investment allocations of your 401k plan. Take a look and see if those are in line with your retirement target goals and where you want to be 
um, as you approach that retirement journey. So as we recap today, you can check out International Women's Day online. You can also use the hashtag break the bias as you think about making these changes in your life and the life of your loved ones. Thank you so much, ladies, for joining me today.